So in studying the climate, we can do it in um, many different ways. We need um, observations to tell us about the structure of the atmosphere and oceans and how they change. And then we need the physics to understand that. And then we now uh, increasingly use climate models. And um, by that, um, I don't mean a physical model constructed out of string or straws or plastic or whatever. I mean a computer model, which is based on the fundamental physics and mathematics that we understand and put into a way that the computer um, can interpret and integrate. So climate models are, as I say, built uh, on very, very basic physics understanding. So uh, if I can just go through some equations that you may be familiar with. The first one is um, Newton's second law of motion. You will know force is mass times acceleration, or acceleration is force per unit mass. So now we're talking about the forces acting on a parcel of air, or indeed um, in the oceans, but I'm going to focus on the atmosphere. And the forces acting on a, a parcel of air are number one, gravity, we'll be pulling it towards the Earth. Number two, pressure gradients. So you have seen uh, weather maps uh, uh, with high pressure regions and low pressure regions Everything else being equal, the air would try to go from the high pressure to the low pressure. It doesn't because of the next sort of force. It's not really a force, but it's how it appears to be a force. It's called the Coriolis force, and that's due to the fact that the Earth is rotating. And the fourth force we need to consider is, um, is frictional drag or viscosity. So we can write down forces mass times acceleration um, with those forces, and that's the first equation or actually three equations because it's a vector. We've got to go up, down, left, right, and forward and back. So there's three equations there as a starting point. The next equation that we use is uh, conservation of energy. And that's telling us that if we have a parcel of air and we add heat to it, either it will get hot or it will expand. Uh, that's a very easy to understand uh, equation. Uh, the third equation is conservation of mass. And that's saying that um, if we have a volume of air and we have um, motion through it, if the air accumulates, the density will go up or it'll go out the other side. So that's, that's just conservation of mass. And the final equation um, is just the equation of state. So you will have heard of the ideal gas law, for example, PV is RT, or there's other equations of state. That's the most simple one. So now we've had uh, six equations, three for the, for the uh, momentum, one for the mass, one for the uh, heating, and one, one for the equation of state. Six equations, and we've got six unknowns. We've got pressure, temperature, density, and three components of wind. So we have simultaneous equations, and we can solve them. So I described the fundamental physics that goes into the equations that are used in the climate models, but of course the, the, the problem comes in the implementation. So in the thermodynamic equation, I mentioned how we needed to know the, the heating sources. and They will come from, uh, for example, solar radiation heating the atmosphere, um, heat radiation leaving the atmosphere. They come from latent heat release when water is uh, evaporates or condensed. And all those um, need to be included in this heating term. Then I uh, described how we need to know about the frictional forces. And here, of course, we need to have some sort of representation of air flowing over uh, rough surfaces, so forests or mountains. And again, this is very difficult to prescribe accurately. Um, another um, factor that we need to include in the models is uh, the topography. So we can either have a very smooth surface or we can try and put in the mountains and, and, and cover properly. And indeed in the climate models they will have topographic variations, mountains and valleys prescribed um, at the resolution of the model uh, to try and make it more accurate. So that brings us on to the whole issue of resolution. When we write down these equations, um, we can do them in a variety of ways, but the most uh, common way is to write them are each on a grid which is covering the globe, uh, perhaps latitude and longitude, and then different levels in height. So you've got a three-dimensional grid, and you solve the equations at each of these points on the grid. You iterate in time, and you solve them all again, and that is what is running um, the computer model. Another complication that I haven't uh, mentioned yet is uh, how we uh, create clouds uh, and indeed rainfall and snow. Uh, 
Uh, so there's, we understand the physics of clouds to a fairly good extent. It's been studied over many years, many centuries indeed. So when you have air rising, it cools and the water vapour tends to condense out and form clouds. So while the uh, fundamental equations are very easy to write down and very easy to understand indeed, um, actually the impl implementation becomes more complicated and the actual, the actual physics, the gut physics of the problem needs to be specified very carefully. Uh, and then uh, we integrate in time and we can understand um, actually the same equations are used for forecasting the weather are as for in integrating into climate into the future. So uh, we step forward in time and we see um, what happens. Now, um, when you set down these equations on a, on a grid uh, and you're going to solve them numerically, you have to start from somewhere. If you're doing a weather forecast, you have all the data that's coming in today and you start today and you do it tomorrow and then you correct it from the data and you do it again and you correct it again and you do it again. Uh, each time you're essentially initialising the whole data set. You're, you're sort of making sure that it's starting in a correct um, place. What we find with climate modelling, uh, very long distance into the future, is that if we start from a very slightly um, different initial data set, the evolution of the climate will go in different ways. So you can start it from a slightly different uh, point and it will wiggle into the future in different sort of ways. And you can run this hundreds of times and you'll get different wiggles overlying each other into the future. So we can't say particularly what wiggle it's on. The Earth will be on one wiggle, but we can't say precisely which wiggle. But we do know that averaged over all of the wiggles will give us an envelope of possibilities into the future. And indeed, when we forecast climate change, we can see how we get an envelope of variability which tracks into the future in one way or another, depending on what we assume, particularly with regard to the concentrations of greenhouse gases. When we use climate models, um, we need to think uh, in advance what question it is we're trying to answer or what it is that we're actually trying to use them for. So we have this big climate model and we can ask different questions of it. We can say, um, what would happen if the, the cloud physics is slightly different to what we had originally assumed? That means, for example, if the air temperature went a little bit colder, and would the ice crystals get a little bit bigger? How much would that affect the temperature? How much the temperature would affect that? And uh, how much that would affect the climate in general? That, that's one particular question. Another question is um, how we represent air-sea uh, interactions. So I've talked about heating of, of the atmosphere, there's also heating of the oceans and there's transfer of heat between the atmosphere and oceans and indeed of course of water vapour and how we represent those processes and how they depend on, on the wind speed and on the humidity is all, all, all crucial to how the model behaves and how we understand the behaviour. If we want to um, look into the future, um, uh, looking ahead to what is going to happen with climate change, of course we have to make some assumptions about how uh, the composition of the atmosphere will change and that's a big question that, that climate scientists can't answer. That's really for the economists to tell us how much coal or whatever is going to be burnt in the future, what will the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere be? And then we can use those as input data to the model and, and see how they respond. We can also look at um, the coupling between things like um, climate change and temperature and um, air quality. So um, you'll be aware that when you use coal-fired power stations, uh, they not only uh, emit CO2, they also emit an awful lot of particulates. Uh, basically, it's sulphate particles. And so those sulphate particles um, will affect people's health, but that's not what I'm going to talk about now. It'll also affect the, um, the radiation balance. It reflects sunshine back to space. So there's an interesting um, byplay between the, the greenhouse gas heating the atmosphere and these particulates reflecting sunshine to space, which tends to cool the atmosphere, and how these two things interact together. And that depends very much on, on the physical properties of those aerosol particles. So again, we need to prescribe these in the model to try and see if we can get a better simulation.
So there's, there's a number of developments in climate modelling, um, all of which are very interesting and um, very exciting. Uh, one, of course, is uh, the uh, use of more and more high-powered computers, which is going to enable us to have much better high-resolution uh, simulations, so higher spatial resolution, but also um, better representation of individual processes. So we're never going to be able to um, simulate in detail all the parts of the climate system. You'd need to get down to tiny little scales of molecules. You can't do that. But if we can get down to, say, 10 metres, then we can really see the shape of clouds, for example, which we can't do at the moment. There's also um, better understanding going on of the physical processes. Uh, indeed, these, these uh, processes between the particulates in the atmosphere, so we've got um, industrial pollution, we've also got natural particulates, say um, sea salt, we've got dust coming from the, um, blown up from the deserts, and all these things hanging around in the air, and what they do um, to the radiation budget and the climate, we'll be able to understand that in more detail uh, in the future. Um, tying all these things in together, um, I hope and I predict that we will have a much stronger um, uh, ability to constrain how climate is evolving and our understand of it, understanding of it into the future.